I'd like to introduce you to the Elon Musk of the 1900s. Here he is. This is George Cope. Doesn't look a lot like Elon, to be fair, but this guy invented solar panels. Now, if I were to ask you, how many of you have heard of George Cove? Stick your hands up. Yeah, it's not that many. I wonder how many of us all know about Elon Musk in 100 years. But anyway, if I'd asked you, when did solar panels come to be, you might have said, ah, oh, was it NASA, space, sexy, satellite technology in the 50s? And that's not a bad answer. But one of my colleagues at Oxford, Saganda Sarvesta, has been looking through old papers and the patent records. And it looks like George Cove invented the panel in 1904 and patented it in 1905. And here he is, proudly, with his zinc antimony alloy solar panels that captured about 5% of the energy from the sun. It's not bad when today's panels capture a bit over 20% on a commercial basis. Now, George here had the wind in his sails. It's September uh, 1909. He's got the tech. He's got the patents. He's getting a bit of publicity. They knew about him in the States and Canada, even in Australia, which is where I'm from originally. He had a company and some investors. He didn't actually know how the things worked because Einstein had just discovered the photoelectric effect, so that's kind of fair enough. But he was ready to go. And then the weird thing happened. It may have changed the course of human history. George was kidnapped. And his kidnappers took him away and said, you've got to stop working on these panels or else. Now, we don't exactly know what happened. I'm conscious we're just around the corner from Baker Street, so maybe Sherlock Holmes might just jump in and help us out a bit here. But what we know is that Cove says that a guy called Frederick Eustace and another accomplice took him away. And there's speculation that Eustace was operating on behalf of either Edison, the big utility at the time, or a company called Standard Oil, which we now know as Exxon. Eustace says Cove kidnapped himself to raise publicity for his venture. Kind of crazy idea. Maybe he was breaking the rules. But it didn't work because a year later, roughly, the whole venture was dead and solar was dead for another 40 years. It's kind of a tragic story. Just imagine if all the money that we'd plowed into fossil fuels over the last century had gone to solar and renewable technologies instead. Isn't that tantalizing, an idea? I think the costs of our energy system and our prosperity it would be completely different. But I'm here today to tell you that actually that vision of a very low-cost, technologically advanced energy system is still possible. But I want to start by asking you a question. How much do you think it's going to cost us to get to a fully decarbonized net zero energy system? And I've got four options up here on the screen with a couple of kind of rough and ready comparators to give you a bit of an idea. So, you know, the biggest ones at the top, 10, 20% or more actually of GDP, the cost of a big war, basically. And all the way down to the bottom there. So I'm going to, a bit of audience participation here. We want a show of hands. Have a look at those four options. Have a think which one you're going to vote for. Just vote for one. Make sure you do vote for one. Okay, so hands up for it's going to cost us more than 20% of our national income to completely decarbonize the energy system. Okay, it's a minority, but it's a it's not, not insignificant minority. Hands up for 10 to 20%, right? So this is like the big response to a pandemic. It's a bit more, again, great, okay. Let's have a look at 2 to 5% of national income. That's the annual defense budget. That looks like almost a majority of the room there and 0 to 2%, so the cost of bailing out a few banks. So there's a good chunk of people there too. Very interesting. Which one do you think's right? 
well, I'm going to say none of them are right. It's going to be negative. We're going to save money by this transition. And that might be a bit of a cheat because you're thinking, hang on, I thought about the capital investment. And, it's, but yeah, it, I'm, and I'm going to explain why that this transition can actually increase GDP, increase jobs, and make us richer. And not just why it might, why I think it's actually likely to do that. And to do that, let's go to the data. So here's the price of coal for electricity generation. Way back when uh, George Cove was thinking about his panels in 1905 through to today. It's the red line. It's not really going anywhere. Then you compare that with the cost of solar. It's the blue line. Starting at 1950-60-ish, it's fallen by more than a factor of a 1,000 since then. The, the, the eagle-eyed among you will have looked at the, the scale on the vertical axis there. About four years ago in a TEDx talk, I said that our calculations at Oxford suggested that by the early 2020s, solar would be cheaper than coal. And a recent report from the International Energy Agency says that solar is now the cheapest electricity in history, which is quite stunning given just how much more expensive it was several decades beforehand. Now, things go up and down. It's not quite as neat as that nice little straight line that you've got on the chart there. But you don't have to be Elon Musk to know which of these two technologies is going to win the battle for the lowest cost form of energy. Why? Well, the dynamics are fairly obvious. Most of you probably have a phone in your pocket, and I dare say that it didn't cost you over 10,000 bucks, and it doesn't weigh, it isn't the size of a brick that's weighing you down. And that's because of the process of technological innovation. You produce more phones, they become cheaper, and then you want more of them. The same is true of solar. The same is also true of related technologies in electric vehicles, in batteries. And what we're seeing is a whole process of learning by doing across the clean energy technology ecosystem that is bringing down costs, which is fantastic. And it's happening fast, and we're very near the tipping point that will make the whole system cheaper, if we're not already there. Now, why is it that we don't seem to all believe that yet? And, you know, those of you who thought this is going to be very expensive, you're in very good company. Here's a chart. It's a bit complex, a bit detailed, you can turn your brains on for a moment. On the left-hand panel, in the blue line, you've got the actual costs of solar over time. The colorful lines show the predictions made by respected international organizations of what the costs are going to be out into the future. And have a close look at those predictions, and you can see they're not very good. I mean, they're out by a factor of 10 reliably, year on year. We just keep mispredicting how cheap solar energy and actually other renewable energies are going to be. Okay, now, let's take those dodgy predictions and put them into a model on the right-hand side of what the whole energy system looks like and roll that into the future for 2040. And you can see that electricity here in blue, predominantly wind and solar, it grows. But it's not a radical change, right? This is incremental stuff here. The big sources of energy are still fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas in the gray. Not a very exciting prospect. But remember, the forecasts are a bit dodgy. Let's do something different now. Let's take a better model, a model that respects the data, that uses modern methods, that gives us some confidence intervals around our forecasts, for renewable energy costs. That's now what the left-hand side shows you. And if you put that into a global energy systems model, what does it tell you? Well, you, looking at this, you don't want to be sinking billions and billions into coal, oil, and gas if you want them to be around and generating your return in 2040. There's not a lot of space for the old, expensive technologies. So for me, this is tremendously exciting. I mean, you look at a curve like this, you think, well, it's driven by the data. This is what the economics is telling us. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it does mean that we are going with the grain of the money here to make this transition. It's pretty exciting stuff. It's our work from Oxford from a couple of years ago, but we've now just taken it forwards using the sorts of 
techniques that casinos use to take your money from you, and you probably agree with me, they do a pretty good job of that. So using those methods, a team at Oxford, uh, in the Smith School Institute for New Economic Thinking, the Martin School, has asked the question, how much would it cost if we went faster on this transition, if we gave the whole system a push? And this is what they found. If you take a fast transition that goes to 2040 or 2050 in the blue there, so put, make it clean very quickly, and you compare that to the costs of a slow transition where you've still got fossil fuels in the grey around 2070, how much more expensive is it going to be to go fast on clean energy? That was the exam question. And you've got to factor in the cost of grid upgrades for the electricity system. You've got to do storage and batteries and hydrogen production, all sorts of costs in there. You've got to put in the model. So they're all in the model. And how much more does it cost to go fast on the clean transition? The answer is not a lot. It's not even zero. It's negative. It's a big, fat saving. And do you want to know how big the saving is? $12 trillion. I've got some of my boys there in the front. They can tell you that that is a big number. <laughs> it's got a lot of zeros in it. But let me make that real for you. There's 8 billion people in the world. Very crudely, if we share that kind of prize around among everybody per person, that's $1,500 per person. There's a little question mark there because if you're importing a lot of energy and you're using a lot of energy, you're going to save more. So Europe... Uh, and if you've got a lot of clean energy pr produced, say Africa, you're winning. If you've got a huge fossil industry that's going out of, uh, out of business, then you're probably not winning, you're probably losing. And that's perhaps parts of the Middle East, although they can transition too with fantastic solar resources. So there are winners and there are losers, and part of this transition doing it properly is about managing that process. But the point is, the size of the pie at stake for humanity here is enormous. $1,500 per person in today's money is what it's worth to us. Okay, so if the pie is so big, why do we still think it's difficult, it's expensive, it's going to be slow, it's not going to happen? I'm going to go through seven reasons. And trust me, I've spent 25 years being told climate change isn't happening. Okay, maybe it's happening, but it's not serious. Okay, maybe it's serious, but actually humans aren't causing it. Okay, maybe humans are causing it, but you know, maybe there's nothing we can do about it. It does get a bit tiring after a while, to be honest. And now we're seeing this with this transition. Okay, okay, right, okay, fine, there's solar and there's wind, but there's a whole lot of reasons it's not going to work. Let's run through those reasons. There's seven. Reason number one, the sun doesn't shine at night. The sun's going to set yeah, you chuckle, you chuckle, but you know, it's a big deal. How are we going to power the world when the sun's down? The answers, hopefully, are fairly obvious to you, but they're not obvious to everyone. We've got batteries, they're falling in cost. We've got the production of hydrogen, which is also falling in cost. There are lots of ways of storing energy, right? This is not a big problem. Let's move on. Number two, we don't have enough land. We're going to have to carpet the surface of the earth with solar panels and wind farms. It's going to look awful. Industrialize the countryside. The sunlit uplands won't look so good anymore. This chart shows you the amount of land in the red squares required to power all of human civilization. I don't know about you, but it doesn't look that nasty to me. That's number two. Number three. If this is so great, Professor Hepburn, why isn't it happening already? Okay, so part of the answer to that is that the costs have been falling. They're falling as we speak. Actually, they went up a bit, to be honest. That's a little secret during the um, in invasion of Ukraine. But they do, do, they do that. They go up, they come down again. They've reverted to trend just this year. Trend back down again. Okay, so if it's so great, why isn't it happening? Well, here's how much solar there was from, uh, what are we, 65 through to 2005. Might not look very exciting. <laughs> but that's exponential growth. Seriously, this is an exponential growth process. It's just so small, you can't see it. Exponential growth at a very low level is still a very low number. 
Uh, hopefully there are a few mathematicians who get that. Let's fast forward this a little bit to today. Okay, you're starting to see it. It's a little bit like COVID, right? That has the similar sort of exponential growth processes. Nobody's got it. Then actually some people have got it. And then everybody's got it. This is the same growth rate per year, year on year. We've done a forecast, okay? It's not necessarily the truth. Might be wrong, could be high, could be low. But all we've done with this chart is to say, suppose the same growth process continues to 2030. Then instead of 2% of the global energy system, solar will be 15% roughly of the global energy system. That's number three. Number four, you can't run a power system without coal. That's the UK power system from 2013 to 2018. You can run a power system without coal. I'm just going to kind of put that up and leave it there. Uh, number five, we're going to have to dig lots of holes in the ground to get all the minerals to make for these wind turbines and these cars and these panels and the rest of it. Look at this. It's ugly. It's big. It's nasty. And yes, we're going to have to dig some big, ugly holes that are going to be nasty. What you're not told when you hear this argument is just how many big, nasty, ugly holes are we going to have to build, or dig, rather, if we continue running a fossil fuel system. We actually have to extract... It's not quite 100 times as much as we have to extract with the minerals, but it's well over 10 times as much if we continue extracting resources from the fossil system. Now, that's not to say this is not a problem. There's an awful lot that needs to be done to manage the supply chain, the human rights issues, the workers' rights around minerals extraction. But it's a much smaller problem than fossil extraction. And last time I checked, you can't recycle coal, whereas you can recycle the minerals that are going into the clean energy system. Uh, fifth, I think we're up to. China's stuffing it all up with all their massive investments in coal. And they have increased investments very recently. But even with those increases, China is still investing almost double into solar and wind as they are in coal. And coal doesn't have much of a shelf life there or anywhere else in the future. And finally, won't the big fossil fuel companies stop it? They've got a lot to lose. Look at the profits, tens, hundreds of billions. And indeed... Uh, there's a vested interest in the continuation of the existing system. But there's also money to be made in the transition to the new system. And there's money for them to ma be made, an important role for them to play in taking CO2 out of the air, sadly, because we're too late right now. And if they don't move swiftly, this is what they're going to face. Uh, many of the young people here won't know what Kodak was, but a Kodak moment used to be a precious thing that you caught on camera, and now it's a moment where you go out of business because you haven't seen a change in technology coming your way. That faces the oil companies. So let me wrap up. What I want you to leave this talk with is a sense that the data are telling us that the economics of the clean energy revolution is there. It's where it needs to be. And when the economics is there, the politics becomes a lot easier. So a lot of these reasons why it won't happen are just going to disappear. There's a lot of work to be done. We need a big push. But to go back to the previous talk, yes, we can. And actually, yes, we will.